So thank you so much for, for having me here. Um, didn't really prepare super formal remarks because I was looking at the time and it seemed like we were gonna be very tight on time here, but we're gonna hear a great panel from, on uh, economic integration and the regional development of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, coincidentally, I wrote my column on this exact topic today, actually. I um, would encourage you to go to, if I can do a little self-promotion, can would encourage you to go to newsweek.com. Uh, you can look at the homepage, the opinion section, you'll see my piece on this. Uh, my basic argument um, is that this region, which too often gets neglected, I think, by Western liberals, both uh, on both sides of the transatlantic alliance, really can and ought to serve as, a, as an inspiration. Uh, you know, as, speaking as someone, I'm a research fellow at the Edmund Burke Foundation. I'm very active in kind of uh, trying to resuscitate a, a, a more traditionalist notion of, of conservatism uh, in America. And as a lot of like my fellow American conservative colleagues try to basically philosophically and intellectually find themselves, find who we are and who we actually are, especially in the tumultuous aftermath of uh, the, of, uh, the Trump presidency, and uh, obviously from an American perspective, uh, President Trump kind of shattered a lot of uh, the old sclerotic orthodoxies, we might say, um, within the American political establishment. Th this region really serves as a place of inspiration, I think. There are a lot of things uh, that the Visegrad countries, uh, Austria perhaps, uh, to a, maybe a very slightly lesser extent, are, are, are really doing right. And I think that they are doing these things right as a direct result, obviously, of um, the at times painful history of the region. I think out of the, the fires of, uh, obviously, of Nazi and Soviet occupation were forged a, 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 a love of, of, of a more traditionalist strand of freedom, a freedom based around national identity, uh, based around uh, love of one's own culture, one's of uh, trying to preserve one's own heritage. Um, you know, and again, like as an American who's thinking primarily, not exclusively, but primarily about trying to kind of align the future of American conservatism with, the, with this more traditional strand of thought, this really actually is in our tradition itself. Um, you know, in the Federalist Papers, which were kind of uh, instrumental to the founding of the United States, you can look at uh, no less a founding father than John Jay in the Federalist Number no. 2, uh, which is a profoundly nationalist essay that John Jay wrote. He talks in like the fifth or sixth paragraph about uh, the, uh, the ties of commonality, commonality and the mutually interdependent bonds of citizenship that were forged out of the fires of the Revolutionary War against uh, King George III of Britain. Very similar, actually, I think, to kind of the ties of, uh, of citizenship that have been forged here in a lot of these Central and Eastern European countries um, in the aftermath, of course, of the fall of the Berlin Wall and trying to recover and preserve a sense of national heritage. So really just delighted to be here. Um, on a personal note, I'm a quarter Polish. It's my first time being in Poland, so just really happy to be here for that reason on a personal heritage note as well. Um, probably should try to get this panel started, though. Start. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so, okay, I see us up there then. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to hear today from um, six speakers. Uh, first, we will uh, have notes of introduction from Tadi, uh, and apologies if I mispronounce anyone's name, I'm really, I'm trying my best here. Um, first, from um, Tadeusz Koszynski, who's a Minister of Finance, Development Funds, and Regional Policy here in Poland. And we will uh, also hear introductory notes from Gergely Eckler, Secretary of State at the Ministry of Family in Hungary. So, um, oh, and uh, um, one video will be at the end. So uh, let's start with those introductory notes then, if we can. Can everyone hear me? Actually, I can hear you, but I'm not sure if, if I, I should start. Is it my turn? Yes, it is. OK, thank you so much. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here and have some introductory remarks uh, for this panel. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if, we, if the collective unconscious exists, uh, the thousand-year-old connection between our countries or our nations must have an imprint in our collective unconscious. Uh, we live together in various political conglomerates. We live next to each other. We have had our good times, we also had some really troublesome days. Together, 
together and uh, against each other as well. But if we put aside, and I think that we need to put aside the historical wounds or conflicts and take a look at the second millennium of our region from an economic point of view, I'm quite convinced that uh, our EBITDA, that is the earnings before interest taxes, deprecation, amortization, uh, is negative. Uh, it is evident again that uh, in the Intermarium region, V4 countries have strong economic ties to each other. If we take V4 as a whole, then on the average, the three of four V4 countries are the second most important trade partner of the re remaining state. It is accounted for almost one fifth, it's around 17 or 18 percent of each member state's export or imports. The growth in trade has increased by 60 to 85 percent in the past decade, depending on the country. In recent years, we four countries with their 2 to 5 uh, percent annual GDP growth, growth exceeding the level of the EU 7, uh, 27 average, have become the economic powerhouse of the Euro European Union. Last year, even with the economic hardships of the COVID-19, the economies of the V4 countries have shrunk less than their EU counterparts. And after the pandemic, they are expected to rebound faster. Just to bring a Hungarian example, uh, in Q1, uh, the Hungarian GDP grew by 1.9%. And if we take into consideration that the German one uh, has decreased by 1.8, then we are in a 3.7 uh, plus uh, when compared to Germany. So, uh, this informal internal structure of the EU has strong economic foundation. The volume of trade between the V4 and Germany is double the volume of the trade between Germany and France, and the triple the volume of trade between Germany and Italy. In terms of the EU dossiers, in recent years this tripolarity has been clearly detectable in debates about high-profile cases, like migration or the budget. So we tend to share uh, the same ideas and interests, and it seems that nowadays we are capable of articulating them jointly. But what do we use economic success for? If we take a look at Hungary, prior to the current crisis, the economy was booming. It was like 4 to 5 uh, percent annual GDP growth. Wages were rising and unemployment rate, rate fell to a historic low. It's, it was like 3.4. And uh, at the same time, uh, families enjoyed an unprecedented wide range of benefits and advantages. Uh, and what is the reason behind this? Uh, in 2010, uh, we made full employment and work, uh, and work, fast, uh, work fast society a top priority. And um, since then, we have clear results. Uh, since 2010, employment rate has increased by 15%. Uh, which is, among, which is um, the second highest in the EU, and uh, among men we have the highest in the EU. It was like 17.6%. Uh, at the same time, this economic prosperity uh, and the growth of uh, employment have paved the way for launching a family-friendly family -friendly decision-making in the past 10 years. And now we also have a successful family policy. This duality of a successful economic policy and the targeted measures of family policy are the core of the way we are making uh, what we used to call, or how we, how we used to call it the Hungarian model. Since 2010, uh, we have managed to raise total fertility rate by 24%. The number of marriages by, we have almost doubled by 84%. The number of uh, divorces dropped by 26% and the number of abortions dropped by 36%. First, discussion on strengthening families has been put on the agenda 10 years ago. Today in Hungary, there's a broad consensus that on the need of helping families and promoting the traditional family. At the same time, Hungarian family policy has become an international reference point. More or less, these trends apply for the whole region. And to sum up, what we used to say, or what we usually say, families first. And that's our message from Hungary to you. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much, Secretary Eckler. Um, Minister Kloszynski, if you would be so kind as to give your remarks whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, so, uh, just, uh, uh, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to uh, deliver an introductory speech uh, on Poland's forward-looking engagement with Central and Eastern European countries, uh, which is uh, aimed at uh, to foster better economic integration and a more harmonious uh, development across the whole region. Uh, as this conference is marking the establishment, establishment of the uh, Collegium Intermarium, I'd like to congratulate the organisers and wish them every success in forming the future intellectual leaders of integration processes in that part of Europe. The successful economic integration of the Central and Eastern Europe uh, region is an important foreign policy objective for, for Poland. Uh, I'd like to refer to two key cooperation formats uh, driving this process of enhanced economic and regional cooperation for, uh, forward. Firstly, the, of course, the Vidigard uh, Group, uh, the V4, and secondly, the Three Cs Initiative, the TSI Initiative. I'd also like to note the role of the strategy for the Carpathian uh, region uh, at the end. So, the Visegrad, uh, Visegrad uh, Group. The experience of successful economic transformation and close cooperation of positions on major items of the EU policy agenda are a key factor supporting the close cooperation in the frame, framework of the Visegrad uh, Group. Uh, the growing economic clout of the V4 countries can, for example, uh, be reflected by the fact that in the first two decades of the 21st century, the V4 countries roughly doubled their GDP per capita, whereas uh, for, for, for all the other 27 EU member states, there was an increase of only about 20% uh, recorded in, in the same period. Uh, the V4 economies are swiftly recovering from the COVID-19 crisis, and uh, are projected to return to a stable growth path uh, already uh, in, in this year, in 2021. Uh, the European Commission's spring economic forecasts forecasts growth of 4% for Poland, 5% for Hungary, 3.4% for the Czech Republic, 4.8% uh, for Slovakia. The current Polish presidency, presidency of the V4, which coincides with the 30th anniversary of this cooperation format, is providing the necessary political momentum for a strengthened co collaboration. And the anniversary is marked by joint declaration of the V4 Prime Ministers, signed on the 17th of February this year in, in Kako, which highlights specific fields of cooperation within the group, covering, amongst others, further extension and deepening of the EU single market, development of enhanced cross-border cooperation under the uh, Interreg uh, programmes. It's also important to stress the role of the International Visegrad, uh, Visegrad Fund, which uh, has so far funded nearly 2,400 scholarships and supported the implementation of nearly 6,000 projects by NGOs, local governments, scientists uh, and artists. Let me also refer to the Three Seeds Initiative, the, to the TSI uh, Initiative, uh, launched in 2016 as an important instrument of cooperation shaping stronger economic and infrastructure links across uh, the Central and Eastern Europe uh, uh, region. There is a huge economic potential of the TSI region. Uh, the combined GDP of the 12 participating, com participating countries amounts to over 1.7 trillion euro, and the uh, infrastructure investment needs will total 1.1 trillion euro by the year 2030. Tackling the serious bottlenecks in existing transport corridors, gas supply and digital infrastructure networks is a critical factor for the successful economic development of the region. Poland is prioritising investments capable of improving connectivity and security of energy supplies along the north-south axis. We also welcome the outcomes of the recent TSI summit in Tallinn, uh, which resulted in additional commitment from Poland to increase the capital of the TSI fund from $500 million to $750 million, uh, providing additional financing for relevant infrastructural projects uh, in the region. In the region sorry. As for the Carpathian strategy, the Polish government is also promoting a large regional cooperation of the Carpathian uh, countries. This largely mountainous region, which still lags behind in terms of socio-economic development, has a truly unique and untapped uh, growth uh, potential, especially in tourism, eco-farming and sustainable industry-related uh, sectors. 
Therefore, Poland is consistently seeking the support of the Carpathian countries for the adoption of the EU macro regional strategy for the Carpathian region. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm really, truly delighted to be able to share my perspectives on economic and regional cooperation in Central and Eastern Europe and very much hope that uh, later on in this panel we'll elaborate in more detail on some of these perspectives. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Kleszynski. So we'll proceed with then with the panel. I think we'll uh, go from uh, right to left and then we'll end back on video. So uh, presenting first will be uh, Dr. Katarzyna Schmick of the National Institute of Rural Culture and Heritage. Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, institution of cultural heritage of Pol Polish and we would wish luck to this initiative as is Collegium Intermarium. I would like to draw uh, your attention when it comes to regional development to the tradition as an important factor of integration and regional development. I will use the example of uh, traditional culture, which is best discussed in terms of intangible cultural heritage. It consists, as I shall briefly remind you, practices ideas, messages, knowledge, skills, as well as their material correlates, tools, handicrafts, and cultural space. The members of this community consider them part of their heritage. They're alive uh, now, contemporaneously, and, as a, and is constantly reproduced, transmitted in direct transmission. It exists in the form of a living social circulation of cultural content, the common knowledge and social practices of the inhabitants. It is compatible with human rights and the principles of of sustainable development. Intangible cultural heritage is manifested, among other things, in traditions, trans oral transmissions, performing arts, social cultural practices, knowledge and practices about nature and the universe, in knowledge and skills related to traditional crafts. This heritage is valued internationally as evidenced by uh, the Convention on the, the Protection of this Heritage adopted by UNESCO in 2013 and ratified by Central European countries. What aspects of integration and development does this act of international law and the phenomena of intangible heritage point to? What does it imply for regional development issues? Well, first of all, intangible heritage, like heritage in general, is defined in terms of a good, a common good. And this implies a positive valorization of any pro-integration activities formed and realized around heritage, building relationships, therefore, regardless of the level, international, regional, municipal, is also based on values and on positive resources, on positive emotions. In an idealistic dimension, it will be building, as I call it, communities of good around the element of tradition. Second, let us turn our attention to the heritage depositories, that is, people who recognize a particular heritage as the source and expression of their recognized values, beliefs, social practices. Practices. Spe uh, here I will quote uh, specific uh, for on the National Institute, specific elements of heritage represent for them an important factor in the formation and identity, transnational, national, local, family, or individual. Heritage elements can therefore be differentiated according to how broadly the public accepts them as their own. It is possible, for example, to distinguish between uh, heritage elements that have such universally recognized values that they will count as, as heritage national heritage, while others of local significance only recognize by a particular local community. The aforementioned communities of good formed around folk traditions uh, will thus be the communities that strengthen the sense of values and the system of values, and at the same time shape identity as a differentiating factor of my community. It is a factor differentiating my community, local, regional, national, supranational, but also as a factor uniting my community on every level with other communities 
with which I share the same traditions, songs, fairy tales, dances, elements of dress, ways of celebrating holidays, traditional ways of farming or breeding. Thus, this inherent intangible heritage, integrally related to people and communities, is an excellent tool for cooperation across differences while preserving the integrity of the local identity of the community. Thirdly, the protection of intangible heritage is not about freezing it in some unchangeable, once-defined canonical form, but about taking care of the continuity of intergenerational transmission of knowledge, skills, and meanings. Thus, the integration around the heritage serves both the present and the development, modernity, and the future. This is because the creative expression of the young generation is inscribed in it. The young people bring in elements of innovative thinking like modernized, modernizing patterns, techniques, applications. They introduce them and the figure of the folk artists on the internet or social media, etc. The older generation, on the other hand, makes sure that the emerging works of art uh, like folk carvings, paintings, Easter eggs, Krakowian nativity scenes, etc. Or, Christ or festivities, Christmas caroling, the Polish uh, dinner on Christmas Eve, remained as faithful as possible to the cultural patterns that the older generation inherited from their ancestors. Most importantly, the generations cooperate because it is a condition of survival of intangible cultural heritage and the cooperating multi-generational local often family community may become a nucleus of supra-local, supra-regional international integration. Therefore, fourthly at least, it can be observed in the course of depositories' work on the preservation of their intangible cultural heritage phenomena that we move from thinking in terms of environment and community to thinking in terms of community. This happens when members of one group perceive that they share a common characteristic with other groups, such as having one skill, experience, or knowledge in the practice and transmission of intangible cultural heritage. For example, craftsmen from different regions using similar smithing or pottery techniques, women craftswomen from different regions find common patterns on their embroidery and gingerbread. Storytellers see that the same motif, for for example, of, of the so-called living water reviving healing guarded by monsters appear in appears, appears in many fairy tales from different parts of Europe. By establishing supra-regional relationships between communities cultivating a given tradition, it becomes possible to build a supra-regional community of people who cultivate and recognize as their own the same element of this heritage and who share a sense of connection and unity and common identity uh, practicing and transmitting this culture across the boundaries. Let us recall a fresh example. In this March, the Minister of Culture, National Heritage and Sports submitted an application for the inclusion of rafting, timber rafting, in the representative list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity. Poland is the coordinator of this application which is the culmination of several works of effort in six countries, Austria, the Czech Republic, Spain, Latvia, and Germany, to enter the tradition, which is the traditional skill of making rafts and floating them. Uh, it began with the inscription of the tradition of the Polish rafting center Ulanowo in the Podkarpacie region on the national list of intangible cultural heritage in 2014. And the Ulan rafters were making efforts to get on the representative list on their own. When the work was undertaken, it turned out that they, they have to undertake cooperation, discussions, arrangements with other few groups in rafters in Poland. In the course of these public consultations, the communities of rafters from other European countries revealed themselves also willing and ready for, for an international entry. So the work was prolonged, new communities were added, social consultation expanded, and the Ulanov rafters had said to goodbye to the belief that they are unique in the world. That is, they had to define their uniqueness in a new way.
We are unique not because our intangible heritage is inimitable and the only on the, on one on earth. Our uniqueness lies in the fact that while preserving the integrity of our community and our tradition, we can cooperate on an international scale. Thus, the rafters of Ulanov have moved from thinking in terms of competition to acting in terms of cooperation. And it is in such multidimensional, emotionally involving processes that integration and regional development based on intangible culture heritage is forged. Thank you. Okay, next we will hear from Dora Schutz, who's the international director at MCC in Budapest. Distinguished guests, dear ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. It is a real honor to be here. As outlined in Josh's excellent op-ed as well, Central Europe is a fascinating and rapidly growing region. Figures show that the Visegrad countries are the engine of economic growth in Europe. Their growth rate is well above the EU average, their GDP is growing almost twice as fast as most members of the Eurozone, and seven out of the EU's top 10 fastest growing economies are in our region. But in the next few minutes, I would like to discuss a different aspect of regional development. I would like to focus on one of the most vital conditions for growth, which is, and should be, education. Istvan Seicheni, who was also mentioned today um, uh, by Director uh, Santo, who is still known to many as the greatest Hungarian, was a Hungarian politician, a great statesman, a political theorist, and a prolific writer. In 1830, Seicheni wrote that the strength of a nation depends primarily on the quality of its intellectual elite. I think this is particularly true in our region. When, but when it comes to our elite, we have a huge challenge to overcome, which is the brain drain phenomenon. Our brightest talents are threatening to leave, attracted by professional op opportunities abroad. We will not be able to preserve our strength and our ability to grow without finding a way to keep our talents in the region. But how can we do this? It is, of course, somehow related to economy. We have to be able to offer a good quality of life, adequate wages, interesting opportunities, potentially even tax cuts for young people. But there is another side to this. Our young people need to want to stay. They have to know that they have a duty to fulfill and feel the pride in doing so. And this is the point where education comes into the picture. Because during those formative years, it is crucially important which values and larger vision we convey to our youth. If you allow me, I would like to share a bit of a, a more personal experience. I was born after the regime change in the 1990s. My parents and most of my teachers were raised and gained work experiences during communism. We were often told in school that we should feel very lucky for all the amazing opportunities that we have, even if it's just having the option to learn a foreign language that was not Russian or go and study abroad. My peers and I were constantly encouraged to grasp these opportunities, but we have never really been told what for. We never really talked about our civic responsibilities, the future of our nation, region, and our role in all of this were never discussed in school. I do think that it's time to change this. We need to have an education system which enables our country's youth to know both the past and present of Central Europe. We need to provide sufficient information, ask the right questions, and have thought-provoking conversations with them. This is the only way they can be proud of their roots, know what great opportunities the region has to offer, want it to prosper, and most importantly, feel that they are willing to work and fight for it. This is why institutions like the Collegium Intermarium or Matthias Corvinus Collegium MCC, the institution that I represent here today, are great initiatives. The idea of MCC came from the realization that the mass education system simply fails to fulfill a number of essential educational roles. When attending a lecture in Hungary, a university student often goes into a hall with 200 other students listening to a one and a half, a half hour long pre-written presentation without much interaction. At MCC, on the other hand, we provide personalized small group trainings and unlike it was during communism, we encourage our students to take responsibility and action for the benefit of not only their immediate environment, but also their nation and more broadly speaking, their region. I'm very happy to say that there, it seems that there is a demand for this. We currently have more than 1,800 students, and 
after five years, we will have close to 10,000 participants enrolled in our 35 centers across Central Europe. We also aim to establish further partnerships with the best institutions in the region, with partners from Poland, Czechia, Slovakia, Austria, and Slovenia, among others. In order to make sure that the idea of Central Europe is not only some dry, distant historical fact, but a reality, and an environment that our young citizens know and appreciate. I firmly believe that creating a patriotic elite is a fundamental condition for the growth of our region. And I'm very happy to see that more and more institutions are joining forces in this great endeavor. I wish you best of luck with this for the next years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dora. We will hear next from uh, Sviatoslav Yurash, who's a member of the National Parliament of Ukraine. Thank you very much. Turned on. So first, thank you very much uh, for this honor. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce myself briefly, if I can. Uh, I have the dubious honor of being the youngest ever member of Ukrainian parliament, as well as the reason why I'm here is because I lead uh, two biggest caucuses in Ukrainian parliament. First, the conservative caucus in our parliament, and the second, the caucus on intermarium. But, uh, of course, for me, this event represents something very deep and profound about the reality of the uh, Central European spirit. The fact that this is initiated here is a very important symbol of the role that Poland has clearly captured in uh, its achievements since the independence from communism since 91. Poland has clearly shown the way in terms of how to reform yourself, how to achieve success, and how to join European and European institutions of respect and dignity. For us in Ukraine, for us the Ukrainian conservatives, it is a very important lesson that we are learning uh, actively and we are studying for. And I hope that in this Collegium Intermario, many more Ukrainians have a chance to learn this and to become these agents of all the great news and achievement that Poland has managed to have. Uh, in the past. But to get to the meat of the matter, that is the topic of our conversation today, and the economic possibilities, I must say that uh, our government is uh, trying to basically revitalize various areas which haven't been touched for the entirety of our independence. We have opened up the land market. Of course, everybody knows Ukraine as the grand uh, basket the breadbasket of Europe, and uh, we opened the land market finally for possibility of investment and uh, privatization so that many more countries can join in in building up the economic potential that Ukraine could provide for the world and for Europe. We are launching the biggest privatizations in 91. We are also knowing the big issues with rule of law. We, are, we have launched and uh, we are relaunching many of the institutions that are supposed to keep uh, and inform and support investors in Ukraine because we are very keen on telling the message to the world that Ukraine is open for business. And of course the COVID had hit us all, hit us particularly, and we are basically relying on cooperation with the world right now to truly uh, launch with all these reforms that we have voted and started in our country into the years that will come, years of hopefully success and rebounding that come after COVID. But first, of course, subject to my country is a big one, uh, both in terms of problems and in terms of possibilities. Uh, but nothing unites, uh, when speaking with Ukrainians, our country more than the realization of the success that our Western neighbors have had. And in that, we are planning and building the vision uh, to try and bring our countries closer in terms of institutions, in terms of uh, reforms that we can learn from and replicate in our country, and in terms of cooperation with institutions such as this one. And I'm very clearly uh, wanted to indicate that as our parliamentary caucus, the Intermanium Caucus, has been launched with one clear objective in mind. That objective is to show that as far as the primary institutions of Ukrainian government, Ukrainian parliament, is very willing and well, very able, having more than a majority of MPs in this caucus from all the factions and all the parties, except for the pro-Russian party, who of course wants integration, but different integration. Uh, and that 
that we are willing and able to support any steps that our government are announcing in terms of bringing countries closer. Of course, you are familiar with the Lublin Trinity, with the document that was signed by five nations here in Warsaw barely a week ago, uh, as clear steps in that direction. And as far as, uh, as, far as Ukraine's parliament, that it, this idea of bringing together members of parliament to support such legislation is extraordinarily popular. And uh, despite from the occasion of political uh, games that some actors play, it is, that is not able to try and distract us from the grand possibilities that exist in cooperation, building up our, our joint institutions. And I hope with the great work that you are doing here, we can build up many more of them. And we can learn these lessons, again, with joining your land institution, institutions with self-respect and dignity. Uh, in that pursuit, we can learn from your story, from your example, and achieve that, not withdrawing from the basic values that made us who we are. And that, again, Together, as we've done in the past, we can build the future of Europe. Thank you very much. Up next, we have uh, Matthew Tiermond, who this program describes as an economist and publicist, but uh, I think of more as a, a personal friend and general right-wing provocateur. Um, but. Uh, Matthew, would you like to enthrall us? Thank you, Josh. You're a, you're a mensch. We, uh, we're both uh, Claremont Institute uh, fellows, which is uh, a preeminent think tank in the United States focused on Western civilizational values and the founding. And I think there's a lot of corollaries with Claremont, which also teaches, in addition to pontificates, with what you guys are doing here in this very, very important initiative. Uh, so I have a little bit of a different background than, than most here who have presented, uh, because in addition to doing some uh, public policy, uh, activism and uh, culture war activism. Uh, I'm also a practical economist, not really an academic one. I spent a lot of years on Wall Street and I'm still currently an investment banker uh, actively doing capital raising and working in corporate finance strategy with a lot of companies. Uh, so, you know, that background gives me a little different perspective on the Central and Eastern European uh, project with three C's, the intramarium, and where culture and economics meet. Uh, for a moment, we should look at what economics is. In the academic sense, it is usually defined as a science of allocation of resources. But in a practical sense, and this is the way I, I look at it, it's a study of human activity in real time and a measure of productivity and output. Uh, the economics of the three C's and Central Europe is very interesting. On Wall Street, we refer to this region as an emerging market. And an emerging market is defined by generally higher growth, but also more volatility in that growth. The, the level of secure, uh, probabilistic judgment you make as an investor when looking at an emerging market is very, very different than a developed and more stable market because of that volatility. You have to apply probability that your expectation of what growth rates will be will actually be actualized. And you handicap and price and value uh, assets, cash flows, sovereign debt uh, with that in mind. Uh, the interesting thing, and I am a, a dual citizen, I, I live in Poland as well as the US, uh, and I invest here. Uh, and the interesting thing to me about this region is that the valuations are competitive because of this dynamic, but they're also highly attractive. And what the three C's does in Central Europe is it starts to create a more secure, stable economic base for some reasons I will get into. And that actually makes it much more attractive than most emerging markets. There's a little higher margin of safety to, uh, to power paraphrase uh, a great hedge fund manager, Seth Klarman, uh, who judges the valuation of assets based on that metric of safety. Uh, and in the three C's, I think we're going to see play out because of what has developed over the last three or four years in political integration, and a political integration that's based somewhat on cult shared cultural values, which is important. Uh, but what I think we're gonna see play out uh, with what, what has been created, uh, with what uh, Poland has anchor-led uh, with, uh, with President Duda, having Trump here when he addressed Warsaw, and they, uh, Trump actually engaged the idea of the three C's. Uh, 
what I, what I perceive is going to happen is that the world and the, the economic world is going to recognize that there's a big convergence going on in valuation. And you're going to be able to buy assets at a huge discount despite the high level of quality, especially vis-a-vis -vis, or juxtaposed with other emerging markets. The quality of assets here is very high. And when you look at securities, securities are just uh, the paperization, the, the representation of things like a cash flow or a fixed asset. And the quality of of these assets is higher here because of the people, because of the culture, because of the education. I, I like to use Poland, which is really the anchor of three Cs, with sixth largest uh, economy and nation by, by most metrics in the EU, 40 million people. Also has the highest literacy rate in the EU. It also has the highest level of college education in the EU. So when you see how the cultural impact of, of, of the society impacts the economy, it creates a, another reason why international investors can feel safe investing in a place like this. The fact that Poland can marry uh, with another 11 nations and aggregate to 112 million people, uh, my, uh, my good friend, uh, the, the Minister of Finance, Thaddeus Kraszynski, used 2018 numbers for, for aggregate GDP, which is 1.7 trillion. Well, each year there's been growth in this, and it's now over 2 trillion. Uh, on a per capita basis, though, it is lagging greatly with the Western uh, European Union and European uh, Monetary Union uh, countries. The per capita GDP in, in the three Cs is $17,000. I'm using US dollars, I'm gonna use 2019 numbers, is 17,000 versus the EU average, which is 35,000. So it's about half. That creates for, for especially mid and long-term investors an incredible opportunity for catch-up if they feel that security uh, is going to be more and more stable. And for an economist and investor, security means many things. Uh, it means, for instance, border security, which obviously has been uh, at risk in multiple arenas, coming from the third world with migration crisis, coming from uh, you know, our foreboding neighbor to the east, uh, which has also become a security threat, and that reduces conviction in that security, that safety. Uh, obviously, our friend in Ukraine uh, can speak about that and what that has done. If, if we recall the Hryvna, uh, when Russians invaded, plummeted against every, every major and developed currency. I mean, I remember uh, being in Ukraine around the time, and I think it was 35 to 1 against the dollar, which was down 70% uh, uh, down roughly. Uh, but with security, there's, especially in this part of Europe, there's another very, very important consideration, and that's energy. And what I think will be telegraphed to the world with the three Cs is that a shared energy policy and a working together uh, to uh, achieve uh, raw energy source diversity uh, will also help stabilize these economies and give investors a lot of, of uh, positive expectation for economic growth, uh, the stability that allows them to also feel confident that valuations are going to rise, that currencies will strengthen. Uh, there are uh, economies, obviously Poland with the Zloty uh, has a flexible currency uh, that is allowed to float against those that sometimes see perverted uh, externalities applied to them, like the euro, which had, with the Troika, we saw what happened in 2012-13 with uh, trying to uh, keep Greece in, uh, they printed a lot of money. They engaged in the same sort of quantitative easing that the U.S. did. Uh, they called it LTRO, long-term uh, refinancing option. It was printing money to try and create a pseudo uh, safety, feeling of safety uh, and stability. Instead, it's just going to lead to inflation. We're already starting to see that in all the developed economies. That's actually going to be another example where in this part of the world, especially with coordinated policy in the three Cs, that is also going to be more stable. That's going to telegraph uh, a, uh, a good investment opportunity and a higher probability of convergence for international investors, which is a virtuous cycle that will lead to higher foreign direct investment, that will lead to higher PPE, uh, property plant equipment uh, projects and capital expenditure, that will lead to more job growth. And so all of these things are virtuous cycles that the three C's, by getting these nations together, allows to happen, it allows these dynamics to take hold and hopefully accelerate. There are risks to this, though. And the risks to economies that are competing at higher and higher levels is usually in the public policy realm. It's in government. It's in, 
the intervention into the marketplace. It's uh, among the political class when they believe that jobs are created by the public sector as opposed to the private sector. And in the short term, public sector job growth can create GDP. In the long term, it's usually a drag. And the investment, the return on invested capital you get from public sector job creation versus private sector job creation is highly lagging. And in the intermediate, there's usually the old pay the piper. And there will be either recession, budget deficits. You want private sector job growth. Me, as a private equity investor and investment banker who's done business in Poland, who's closed private equity deals, who owns uh, uh, tradable, investable assets here, uh, both fixed and floating, uh, my own experience is one where Poland is competitive as it is, the high GDP growth, the incredible workforce and cultural dynamics. Uh, there's still a Byzantine structure to do business. Uh, the regulations are very high. The paperwork burden is very high. And the reporting burden is very high. In fact, Grant Thornton did a study a few years ago that Poland, of the larger EU economies, is the most overburdened with paperwork reporting. Uh, and that's a drag. I, when I do deals in the US these days, we can now get a, from soup to nuts, a large capital uh, deal done just using DocuSign. And that is absolutely permittable in a, in a rule of law court setting. Here, you need a lot of notaries, which are a guild that you pay to meet you large sums to sign off on contracts that two counterparties are signing of their own volition. Those kind of dynamics do persist. It does seem like that's going to take some time to work its way out. Hopefully, the three Cs, knowing that you have an incredible economic opportunity, uh, you know, I quoted the per capita GDP, out of the uh, 12 nations, 11 out of the 12 are under the average. The midpoint being of, of the EU, the midpoint being $17,000, that's dragged up by Austria, which is the only one of the 12 nations that's in the top quartile of EU nations in GDP. Uh, with a $35,000 uh, average GDP per capita in the EU, Austria's at 50,000, even higher than Germany, which is because of the weighting of 80 million people is a, also a higher drag up on the average EU. But that opportunity that exists to see convergence and to see per capita GDP rise with so much upside, there, there's an old joke on Wall Street that you don't invest in high margin companies, you invest in low margin companies, profit margins. Because high margin companies are at risk of losing those margins and seeing earnings degraded. Low margin companies, there are opportunities for that margin to expand and profitability to rise. And that's what I perceived to be here as well. And I think most of the developed world investors are going to start seeing that as well. Hopefully, it's more Western investors and less China. That's been a risk. China has been deploying capital here and engaging in a sort of economic imperialism in their long-term hegemonic ambitions. Uh, but I do think we're going to see a lot more Western investment here. And I do hope that some of these Byzantine bureaucratic structures from most of these nations, 11 out of 12, coming out of the Iron Curtain with the post-communist structures, that they will will start to move up the evolutionary cycle. Uh, one more point I will make in line with that is that state-owned enterprises do have a tendency, as again a post-communist vestigial, to crowd out a lot of upstarts and the competitive free enterprise sector. And I'd love to see in many of these nations, if not full privatizations, more flotation of share of these companies. When you look at the WIG, which is the largest index in Central and Eastern Europe, it's the sort of the, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Index for Poland, the majority of companies in that index are state owned, and those are political appointments, and they're not the most competitive entities. They can be good companies who do good work, and I understand the need for having created that system coming out of communism. Nobody wanted a Russian oligarchical free-for-all spoil system, but it's time, 25, 30, 35 years in, to start seeing more privatizations and more competition. With that said, I think the future is very bright for this economic region. I think it's going to be a dominant player for emerging market portfolio managers in the West, where the deepest pools of capital are, like New York, like London. And I think that the future is very, very bright. I think the next two to three generations will be uh, economically led uh, in part by the growth in these 12 nations of the Three Seas Initiative and the, the role this university will have in helping the economics, helping the education system cannot be, uh, cannot be overstated. So thank you for having me and hopefully I didn't offend too many people. A few people's okay. Okay, thank you so much, Matthew. <clears throat> so uh, next we will hear um, uh, from video from uh, Piotr Pakowski, who's Under Secretary of State at the Polish Ministry of Finance. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us. 
Dzień dobry, witam wszystkich Państwa. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me all right. Um, in the beginning of my speech, I would like to recall a story uh, from a few years ago when I worked in the Chancellor of the Prime Minister of Poland, when I was asked to uh, reform the Institute of uh, uh, Central Eastern Europe to change the name to Central uh, European Institute. And uh, going through the, all the parliamentary process, we started about the geopolitical definition. What is the Central Europe? Sometimes associated with the, uh, with the Intermarium region. We can see today that Central Europe and Intermarium are above all else 11 countries of the European Union, starting from Poland down to Croatia. But also we can see we have this uh, conscience that we would like to include in this group uh, the countries which do not yet belong to the European Union, but in a great uh, extent uh, form part of our community in terms of culture and economy. Historically speaking, we have seen two great intents to integrate the nations and states of this uh, of this region. The first one was the, uh, the Commonwealth of Two Nations which was a, a hugely courageous and visionary project of its times. Unfortunately, there was not enough determination to, to expand this project and to and to, to, um, to advance it in a few ways. And another one, probably well known and most declared uh, in the world, was the Habsburg Empire and then um, Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire, uh, the country which Winston Churchill said, if it didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. Uh, from the British perspective or the Austrians themselves, it can be easily uh, seen as a totally positive. The Poles and then many other Slavic countries consider it a prison of nations. We often say it about Russia, but the Habsburg Empire also performed this role to a certain extent. Today, seeing uh, how some conservatives perceive that part of our history, not only in Poland, but in in this area, very, very often uh, seeing the portraits of uh, uh, Franz Josef, and that model of economic development was uh, very, uh, very uh, destructive for the provinces. For example, the Lesser Poland, which for centuries had been one of the richest parts of, of uh, Poland, of the Republic of Poland, but <laughs> became uh, one of the poorest under the Habsburgs. The Krakow elites, uh, looking at Vienna, uh, created the city as one of the best uh, cities, best developed cities, but all the, the, the other parts of the region became um, extremely poor. And similar stories could be said of other provinces. Speaking about the integration um, uh, between the intermarium region countries, we should never follow the Habsburg way, and never compare, uh, never try to uh, re-establish, re-enact the same model the Habsburgs proposed. Uh, because it was uh, the system in which the center became rich at the cost of the provinces. If we want to compare ourselves to the Western countries, we have to make sure that the center of this uh, Central Europe uh, didn't follow the way of Vienna in the 19th century. This is the key point. Today, speaking of sovereignty, we do not speak of any kind of a federation of uh, very strong uh, uh, relations of power, but rather of a strong collaboration between sovereign independent countries, which collaborate closely in the most important areas. Today's so sovereignty, I think we should be grateful uh, um, to the so sovereignty depends mostly on the economy, not by the military. And I think we should be happy because of that. And I believe that for many countries of the Central Europe, 
this, the last years have been a s symbol of a great economic success and also uh, catching up slowly but steadily with the Western Europe. We call it the process of convergency. The process of uh, before the same name was used to, uh, to, to, to compare the development of the Soviet Union uh, regarding the United States, but of course we need something, uh, we mean it in different terms. We want to strengthen the collaboration between the countries of the region uh, everywhere where uh, we can find an agreement where we can strengthen our shared interests. Uh, so just to mention a few economic data that uh, show the growing sovereignty of uh, the countries of a region, it's good to show that between 2004 and 2020, the share of these countries, these 11 countries in the EU, in the total GDP has grown by 6 6, uh, from 6.6 to 9.9 percent. .9%. So we can see uh, how much we have uh, to, to, to keep up with. Too. The GDP growth in most of these countries has been uh, more than 100 percent. Uh, GDP per capita in 2012, it was 50.6 percent of the EU. In 2019, it was already 70 percent. Um, the GDP accumulation by the countries of the region in, in these years was much higher than the EU average. The average uh, salary per hour in these in the countries of the region grew much stronger than the average of the EU. The average uh, salary in this region was uh, 4.6 per hour, and in 2019 it was already 11.1 euro. So the economic data in this in this area there could be much more of it. That's why I think it's necessary to show a few more areas where this um, uh, collaboration is based on the best uh, conditions. The first of these is the economic collaboration, uh, integration of our energetic systems. How important it is, is what happened in Poland last Monday, where um, because of the um, problem in, uh, in the Bełchatów um, power plant, we could import energy from other countries. But there have been cases where some cases could not uh, import energy, so that's why we need it. Poland is no exception. That's why this kind of collaboration makes us independent both from the West as from the East, but I think we're both more concerned with the, with the East. One more system is diversification of the um, raw, uh, raw materials like gas and uh, petrol. Um, our um, disagreement with the Nord Stream 2, uh, though Poland or Ukraine, um, this, this opinion is cream. Uh, Nord Stream 2 is, is against the idea of diversification. So we absolutely agree with Ukraine, all the countries that would like to achieve full independence from Russia and create their own uh, energy uh, market according to themselves. Another area is infrastructure. For example, the Via Carpathia uh, motorway from Saloniki to Kuaipeda through the numerous countries of the region but also some other uh, railway projects, uh, um, river projects. These are all the projects that we want to develop. And the last uh, topic that I think we should mention is our shared voice in the EU. As we can see in, uh, in numerous initiatives that we take up and very positive uh, approach to the uh, European Commission as a um, uh, many countries um, uh, in this in this area are uh, the gross uh, payers in the European uh, in the European um, Commission. We still receive more money uh, than we than we pay in, although we open our markets to the Western countries. But very often we are still. Uh, we're still earning thanks to it. It's worth to pay attention to it. 
it's worth realizing that the um, Intermarium Initiative is, uh, is an initiative of equal independent countries that do not work for any central <coughs> part, be it Warsaw or any other, any other, but it can help grow all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And to conclude uh, this panel, I believe we have uh, pre-recorded video remarks um, from uh, Pavel Yablonski, uh, Under Secretary of State at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So whenever that video is ready. Magnificencio, panie rektorze, panie premierze, państwo ministrowie, państwo posłowie, państwo profesorowie, Szanowni Państwo, wszyscy dostojni goście. Z wielką radością mówię dzisiaj do Państwa w tej formie nagrania wideo jako pełnomocnik polskiego rządu do spraw inicjatywy Trójmorza, dlatego że to dzisiejsze wydarzenie, powołanie kolegium Intermarium, uczelni, której zadaniem będzie kształcenie elit politycznych, dyplomatycznych, gospodarczych, kulturalnych, społecznych, krajów Europy Środkowej, krajów tworzących region leżący między trzema morzami, między Morzem Bałtyckim, między Adriatykiem i Morzem Czarnym. To wydarzenie to okazja naprawdę historyczna. Pokazujemy dzisiaj jako region, jako Europa Środkowa, że jesteśmy miejscem, w którym będzie wykuwać się debata o przyszłości naszego kontynentu, gdzie będziemy kształcić elity dla naszych krajów, elity dla naszego regionu, elity, które będą w przyszłości stanowiły o sile naszych państw. Bardzo się cieszę, że taka inicjatywa o tym międzynarodowym charakterze cieszy się poparciem wielu przedstawicieli świata polityki, świata dyplomacji, świata naukowego, nie tylko z naszego regionu, ale z całego świata, że dzięki temu wsparciu będziemy mogli kształcić na najwyższym poziomie naukowym ludzi, którzy w przyszłości tworzyć będą dyplomację naszych krajów, dyplomację naszego regionu i wzmacniać międzynarodową pozycję, wzmacniać siłę naszych społeczeństw, wzmacniać siłę całej Europy. Bo Europa to dwa płuce, jak mówił święty Jan Paweł II. Płuco, w którym my dziś się znajdujemy, płuco Europy Środkowej, Europy Wschodniej. Przez wiele lat za żelazną kurtyną nie mogło rozwijać się tak dobrze, jak to, to drugie, to położone bardziej na zachód. Dziś, dzięki europejskiej integracji, dzięki współpracy międzynarodowej, odbudowujemy tą równowagę, tą wieloletnią, budujemy, nadganiamy te wieloletnie zaniedbania. I w tej sferze akademickiej, w sferze kształcenia naszych elit, ten dzisiaj, to dzisiejsze wydarzenie, ta dzisiejsza inauguracja jest wielkim krokiem właśnie tego celu, rozbudowania, odbudowania tej elementarnej równowagi. Europa nie może rozwijać się bez równowagi, nie może rozwijać się bez równowagi geograficznej, ale także bez równowagi ideowej. Widzimy dziś, że w dominującym dyskursie publicznym w wielu krajach Unii Europejskiej dominuje w zasadzie jeden porządek, porządek liberalny, lewicowy. Brakuje często mocnego głosu konserwatywnego głosu, który tak naprawdę stał przecież u podstaw europejskiej integracji, u podstaw tej idei, która 7 dekad temu doprowadziła do powstania Zjednoczonej Europy. To, czym kierował się Robert Schuman, jeden z ojców założycieli Europy, aby Europa jako zrzeszenie wolnych, równych, niepodległych narodów mogła się rozwijać w pokoju i we współpracy, w równowadze gospodarczej, kulturowej, we wzajemnym szacunku do naszych tradycji. Dzisiejsza inicjatywa jest przejawem właśnie wsparcia dla tej różnorodności. Ten bardzo mocny głos, bardzo mocny, bardzo mocny sygnał, który wysyłamy dziś na całą Europę, będzie pokazywał, że kraje Europy Środkowej, kraje Trójmorza chcą w tej wielkiej dyskusji brać udział. Nie tylko jednorazowo, ale też chcą, aby ta dyskusja była bardziej zrównoważona na lata, na przyszłość. Będziemy przez lata kształcić ludzi, którzy w tej dyskusji będą brali udział. Jestem przekonany, że ten głos będzie coraz silniejszy. Bardzo gratuluję Państwu tej inicjatywy. Bardzo cieszę się, że choć w tak zdalnej formie mogę być 
i częścią i jako pełnomocnik do spraw inicjatywy Trójmorza zapewniam o tym, że polski rząd będzie tą inicjatywę i inne podobne inicjatywy wspierał, bo przez zacieśnianie tej naszej regionalnej współpracy na wszystkich szczeblach politycznym, dyplomatycznym, gospodarczym, infrastrukturalnym, ale także, co niezwykle ważne, ideowym, akademickim, naukowym, będziemy mogli rozwijać siłę naszego regionu. Raz jeszcze bardzo Państwu gratuluję, życzę Państwu owocnych dyskusji i jestem przekonany, że wiele osób, które wykształci kolegium Temarium, będą w przyszłości, będzie, wiele osób będzie w przyszłości stanowiło o sile wszystkich naszych narodów. Dziękuję bardzo.